Hello, everybody, and welcome to this lecture on hemostasis for USMLE Step 1. As the title kind of hints at, this is for the medical licensing exam, Step 1 specifically. It's not for clinical practice. This really targets exam questions. So the best way to look at hemostasis, especially in terms of USMLE, is divide it into primary and secondary, primary being platelet-based and secondary being the coagulation cascade. So that's how we'll divide it up in this lecture. So starting with primary hemostasis, otherwise known as the platelet plug. So here you can see a diagram of the platelet and all the steps that goes into it. Uh, we have the endothelium up here on this end. And the first step is that von Willebrand factor is secreted both from the platelet and the endothelium uh, from weevil palate bodies, as well as alpha granules. And von Willebrand factor connects the endothelium to the GP1B receptor. Now, before I explain more, it's important that you actually know the names of these receptors because uh, there really is a pathology or a disease state where each one of these is deficient. So it's helpful to understand them in the, in the physiology portion. So von Willebrand binds to GP1B. That creates the initial connection between endothelium then there's some exposed collagen on the endothelium because remember, the platelet plug starts when there's endothelial damage. So the endothelium is damaged, there's exposed collagen that binds to the GP6 receptor. Next, once you have these two connections, the platelet secretes ADP, thromboxane A2, and serotonin. Uh, and these create a positive feedback loop. They come over here and they bind to their receptors and this creates a feedback loop positive. Uh, if you remember, thromboxane A2 is the target of NSAIDs. Uh, after you have this and this here, these, this feedback loop, uh, we come over here to step five, which is fibrinogen cross-links platelets between the GP2B3A uh, receptor on this platelet and there connects on the other end to another GP2B3A receptor connecting platelets, and the chain goes on and on like that. So the first disease state we really have to talk about is von Willebrand disease. Uh, for the sake of USMLE step one, you really only need to know type one. Uh, there's multiple types of von Willebrand disease, but we'll just talk about type one here. The inheritance is autosomal dominant. Uh, and symptoms wise, you know, a good way to look at it is platelet bleeds from primary hemostatic disorders are superficial and the bleeds from secondary uh, hemostasis, aka the coagulation cascade, are deeper bleeds. So, von Willebrand, you're going to see bleeding from dental work, epistaxis, or nosebleeds, um, and some minor surgeries. Or maybe if your patient gets an IV, you just notice that it oozes and oozes and oozes. These people bruise easily as well. And they have heavy menses if they're female. Uh, the pathology here is a decreased number in absence or defective von Willebrand factor. Uh, and as we recall from the previous slide, von Willebrand factor connects the endothelium to GP1B receptor. Um, with von Willebrand disease, you can also have reduced factor 8 in the coagulation cascade. This is because von Willebrand factor stabilizes factor 8. So if you don't have as much von Willebrand, you don't have stabilized factor 8, therefore you have less of factor 8 in the blood. Uh, to test this, uh, the USMLE is going to test you on the bleeding time. Now, in practice, this is never, ever actually done um, because it's very inaccurate and it's there's just better ways. Um, but increased bleeding time. And you'll notice that with all the platelet uh, diseases, it's going to have increased bleeding time. The treatment for as far as USMLE step one goes is desmopressin. Desmopressin, um, DDAVP, actually helps the... Uh, granules and wheel palate bodies secrete more von Willebrand disease, thus upregulating it in the blood. The next disease state we have here is Bernard Solier syndrome. Uh, this is autosomal recessive. Uh, the symptoms are the same as von Willebrand disease. You're going to have those superficial bleeds, nosebleeds, heavy menses, etc. The pathology on this disease is on the other end of the von Willebrand connection. You have a decreased uh, number or absence of GP1B receptors, specifically that connects to von Willebrand factor. The testing is very similar. Uh, increased bleeding time, as we mentioned, which is the case for all primary hemostatic disorders. And an interesting tidbit that 
you might get tested on on US assembly step one is on the full blood smear over here, you uh, see very large platelets. These right here with all the arrows are platelets and they're a lot bigger. Platelets really should be, um, they kind of look like this little stippling here. They're very small uh, normally. So this is a huge platelets. Um, if you read first aid, they use a mnemonic, um, big suckers, Bernard Solier, big suckers, which are the platelets, should be extra large. Um, with Bernard Solier, you also could be th see thrombocytopenia. Um, that could be there, it could not be. And the treatment is platelet transfusion. Okay. Next, we have Glansman, Glansman thrombosthenia. Uh, this is an autosomal recessive, same type of bleeding symptoms, those superficial bleeds. Pathology here is your GP2B3A receptors, which, if you recall, are the receptors that connect to fibrinogen, which then cross-links platelets. So GP2B3A receptors to fit or absent. Once again, like your primary hemostatic disorders, you're going to have an increased bleeding time. The treatment here is platelet transfusions. This is very uncommon, but it does get tested. Now we go on to TTP. TTP, otherwise known as thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Uh, and, you know, if you just look at the name here, the name actually has pretty much all the symptoms in it. Uh, it's not an inherited disorder. Uh, you get, like the name says, thrombotic, thrombosis. So you get microclots, thrombocytopenic. You get low platelets on test. And purpura, you get, you get purpura, uh, large bruises, basically. Um, so the symptoms here are bleeding. Because you're thrombocytopenic, you have low platelets, so you bleed. Uh, you get these microclots, the thromboses, and petechiae in purpura. So each letter, each word in the name actually is basically what you need to know about this. How does it happen? You get defective Adam TS13 enzyme. So let's talk about that a little bit. That enzyme, oh, let me jump back a little bit. Von Willebrand factor, when it is originally secreted from the granules, is secreted in very high molecular weight forms, long chains. Now, that's not a very useful form of it. So what happens is this enzyme, the atom TS13, splits up those high molecular chains of von Willebrand factor into low molecular weight von Willebrand factor. And those low molecular weight forms are the forms that are uh, active and are used to bind the platelet to the endothelium. Well, so what happens if you don't have this enzyme here? You keep those high molecular weight forms. You can't cut them down. And basically, those high molecular waveforms just clump together a bunch of platelets. They're, they're very sticky, and this creates microthromboses of platelets because they stick to the high molecular weight von Willebrand factor, and they can't be let go. And um, so what happens there is because you have these microthromboses uh, in your PBS, you're going to see schistocytes, which are these kind of helmet cells looking things. It's because you have small clots like this right here, and when you have blood rushing by it, you get these shear force that kind of shears these blood cells. So that's what creates the schistocytes. Uh, and these can cause clots in arteries, veins, uh, strokes, and so forth. Uh, your testing is going to show a low platelet count because your platelets are going to be taken up into these clots. These clots are made of platelets stuck together, so they're not going to show up on your CBC. Uh, and then another very crucial finding is the schistocytes on the PBS. Um, you know, with this type of thing, because you're getting shear force, uh, you could also see elevated bilirubin. You could also see a low haptoglobin because you're getting hemolysis in this, right? Uh, the treatment is plasmapheresis, rituximab, or steroids. Those are kind of the big three you need to know for the exam. And one of the other ones that's important for the exam here is heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. Uh, you know, the actual mechanism behind this isn't tested too deeply on USMLE, but it is, it can be touched upon. Uh, you get the same bleeding type symptoms as your primary hemostatic disorders. The pathology here is uh, after heparin is delivered, and this can happen technically any time. Uh, it doesn't have to be right, at, right away after heparin is first delivered. It can happen later, although it is more likely um, to be hit if it happens sooner to the original dosing of the heparin. However, uh, the pathology here is the body creates autoantibodies against something called platelet factor 4. Uh, and that causes the thrombocytopenia. So the treatment here sounds obvious, but this actually is something that's tested heavily on USMLE. Uh, 
if you are suspicious of HIT, stop the heparin is the first thing to do. And this, I have seen multiple questions and practice questions where the answer choice literally is stop heparin. And that's it. That's the answer. If the heparin is causing an issue, stop it. Now, if they were to ask you what should you do instead or what's a better alternative, the, the answer is going to be another direct thrombin inhibitor, okay? Uh, because heparin itself is a thrombin inhibitor, right? So uh, in, in practice, this usually is argatroban. However, for the sake of the exam, it could be any of the direct thrombin inhibitors that you're expecting to know. Argatroban, bivalorubin, dibigatran, okay? So that is HIT. Now let's move on to secondary hemostasis, uh, otherwise known as the platelet, uh, I'm sorry, the coagulation cascade, the factors, everybody's favorite part of hematology. So let's jump into it. Oh boy, let's get into this right here. So focusing on the image here first, you notice there's two parts. There's a wing here, there's another wing here, and then there's a kind of communal joined common wing here. Okay, so the shorter part right here, this is the extrinsic pathway. It's called the extrinsic pathway uh, mainly because it's, it is begun by some sort of extrinsic, uh, how would you say, some sort of extrinsic force. And it starts with factor seven, combining with something called tissue factor. And tissue factor is created by uh, endothelial damage usually. So that's why it's extrinsic because something extrinsically causes an endothelial damage, tissue factor is released or exposed, factor seven is activated and boom, 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 you go all the way down. So that is the part of the extrinsic. It's only factor seven in the extrinsic. Now the intrinsic, there's a little mnemonic that I like to use here, TENET, T-E-N-E-T. -E -E so that stands for 12, 11, 9, 8, 10. So the extrinsic starts with 12, goes to 11, goes to nine, goes to eight, and then 10 is the beginning of the common pathway. Okay, and seven feeds into eight into 10 and you're connected then into the common. Once you get to 10, you go to prothrombin, which is actually, uh, prothrombin is activated into thrombin um, and then fibrinogen and you get the fibrin clot here. Uh, you know, depending on which test books you read, some textbooks actually use the actual names of the factors. So for example, uh, these, these factors all have names, such as there's one called Christmas factor, Hageman factor, but the USMLE is really only gonna test you on the actual numbers. So seven, 12, and so forth. You don't really need to know the actual names, except for thrombin, fibrinogen. Uh, fib fibrin, for example, is actually factor one. Thrombin is actually factor two. Okay. Um, 13 is Hageman factor, but you don't, you do not need to know that. Okay, so remember tenet and then seven. Now, what do we have over here? Well, this is the laboratory end of this. How do we actually measure if these are working correctly? And the answer is we time them. Okay, we, we see the time it takes for the intrinsic to form a clot and the time it takes for the extrinsic to form a clot. And this is called the PT and the PTT. Okay, or the PT stands for the prothrombin time. The PTT stands for uh, the partial thromboplastin time. So let's look at the PT, the PT first. The PT measures the time it takes for the extrinsic factor, extrinsic pathway to form a secondary uh, clot. And if you're wondering, how do I remember which goes to which, PT, PTT? Well, one little mnemonic you can use is PT. Think of play tennis. You play tennis outside, extrinsic. PTT, think of play table tennis. You play table tennis inside. PTT for intrinsic, PT for extrinsic. Okay, now the PT measures the activity of the extrinsic. Therefore, it's going to give you the activity of factors 7, 10, 5, 2, 1. So it gives you the factor 7, factor 10, factor 5, factor 2, which is thrombin, factor 1, which is fibrin. Okay, now if you notice, the only one that's really unique here to the extrinsic is factor seven. Those other four are actually part of the common. PT in practice is used to monitor warfarin. Um, why is that? Think about that for a second. Why do you use the PT? Well, because warfarin uh, 
inhibits, among other factors, it inhibits seven. So with PT, we hit seven here. It gives us an idea of how our warfarin is working. Now the INR, which stands for International Normalized Ratio, basically just gives you a ratio of your PT, the patient's PT, to a normal PT. So an INR of one is normal, meaning that your patient's PT is exactly what it should be. It's the same as what a normal PT is. Now, this is more of step two knowledge, but you want a higher INR for certain types of pathology. So for AFib, you don't want your patients to clot. So your warfarin patients with AFib, you want to target an INR of two to three. And for your warfarin patients with certain types of valve replacements, you actually want it two and a half to three and a half. Okay. Now your PTT, which is used to monitor the intrinsic, it's going to hit you 12, 11, 9, 8, 10, 5, 2, and 1. So it really hits almost everything along the intrinsic and common way. And we use this to monitor heparin. Let's briefly talk about the role of vitamin K. Vitamin K is extremely important in the clotting cascade. Uh, you know, we think of uh, on your OB rotation, you might see that once we have newborns come that are uh, born, we give them a shot of vitamin K. Well, why is that? It's because vitamin K is produced by gut bacteria, actually. And newborns being newborn don't have any gut bacteria, so they don't produce vitamin K. So we give them a shot of vitamin K so they can start producing clotting factors despite not having gut bacteria. So vitamin K in its reduced state actually activates factors 10, 9, 7, and 2. Okay, how do you remember that? Well, one of the ways you can just remember 1972, the year 1972, uh, whereas the one in 1972, you can think of 10, and then of course, nine, seven, and two. So 1972 is your vitamin K, and it's actually also your warfarin uh, factors, the factors that warfarin inhibits. So reduced vitamin K activates these, into the active form and they can now these factors can go down the coagulation cascade but in the process vitamin k gets oxidized and oxidized vitamin k cannot activate factors so what happens here is there's an enzyme called uh, vitamin k epoxide reductase and what that does is it returns oxidized vitamin k back to reduced vitamin k now how does warfarin work warfarin works by inhibiting this epoxide reductase enzyme so by inhibiting this enzyme, all your vitamin K remains in the oxidized state, and it cannot activate 1972 factors 9, 7, 10, and 2. And that is how warfarin works. Protein C and S. I know this is a lot here, and things can get confusing in this because some, some uh, factors are activating, some factors cause clots, some factors prevent clots. Protein C and S are... Uh, little proteins that actually prevent clotting. They prevent clotting, whereas your factors are pro-clotting. Okay. So what do protein C and S do? Protein C and S inhibit, inhibit factors 5 and 8. So think about it. Factors 5 and 8 cause clotting. So if we inhibit those, we're actually going to prevent clotting. So protein C and S bind factors 5 and 8 and inhibit them therefore preventing clotting. This is also a patholo pathology related to this. There are people with protein C or protein S deficiency. So think about that. If somebody has uh, is deficient in protein C, will they clot more or less? Think about that. If they're deficient in protein C, they will clot more because your factor 5 and 8 are not inhibited. So they just run freely and cause your clots. All right, let's get to some of the interesting pathologies here. Warfarin-induced skin necrosis. This is a really nasty uh, and deadly kind of condition, side effect of warfarin. Um, so what does this look like? Well, the picture here is exactly what it looks like. It essentially uh, causes clots in areas that cause then cause necrosis. So these are actually, these aren't bruises. This is straight up necrotic tissue. It can be bullous as well. You can kind of see there's some bulla here. So this is necrotic tissue from warfarin-induced skin necrosis, and this will happen in the first really day or one to three days of warfarin administration. Uh, how does this happen? Okay, well, remember, warfarin inhibits the factors 1972, right? 10, 9, 7, and 2. However, 
warfarin also inhibits protein C, uh, protein C. Well, the fact of the matter is warfarin actually inhibits protein C faster because of the half-life of protein C is shorter. So imagine this, you knock out all your protein C, but all your factors are still running. Remember, protein C inhibits some factors. So if you knock out protein C and all your factors are running, then you're clotting from your factors and protein C cannot prevent that. So you start making these clots uh, and you get necrotic tissue because you no longer have blood flow to these tissues from the clots. You get in a life-threatening hypercoagulable state. The treatment, of course, and this is testing the boards. It seems kind of dumb and easy and obvious, but stop the warfarin. Stop the warfarin. You're probably going to need to anticoagulate in a different way to try and resolve this. Usually, maybe switch over to heparin. Other than that. Let's talk about the hemophilias. These are pretty much just pure memorization. Hemophilia A is X-linked recessive. Uh, you can think of hemophilia A, think of A8, 8A sounds like 8, and that is important because hemophilia A is a deficiency uh, or decreased activity of factor 8. So I think hemophilia A8, hemophilia 8. Okay, you get deep bleeds here. Remember, because this is secondary hemostasis, you get bleeding into the joints, things like that, uh, abdominal bleeds, and so forth. Testing. Well, how do you test uh, factor eight? Remember, it's the PTT. Okay, your intrinsic pathway is going to find that. You're going to have a normal bleeding time as well because this is secondary hemostasis and bleeding time is only increased in primary hemostatic disorders. Uh, you also can just do a pure factor eight uh, count in the lab. That's not going to be on the test probably because that's too easy of an answer. Although in practice, that's pretty much what's done. Treatment, you can give recombinant factor eight or just transfuse whole blood. Oftentimes it's recombinant factor eight. Hemophilia B, also X-linked recept also X -linked receptive, recessive, pardon me. Symptoms are exactly the same as A. Uh, B is deficiency at factor nine. So just remember if A is eight, you're going up one to nine. Again, PTT is increased, you'll have a decreased factor nine count. The treatment is recombinant factor nine or blood transfusions, whole blood. And hemophilia C, just to make it things harder, this one is autosomal recessive, not X-linked. So don't get tricked up on that. This is also sometimes called a Christmas disorder because <laughs> factor 11, the name for that is Christmas. Remember that. Well, you don't have to remember that. That's not going to be tested. Symptoms are the same as A and B. Deficiency of factor 11. And of course, remember A is 8, B is 9. Don't think that C is 10. It's not. You skip over 10 and go to 11 treatment recombinant or whole blood transfusions once again. So I just briefly, briefly, briefly want to go over some relevant pharmacology. Uh, I won't talk too much about this. You can take a screenshot of this if you like. I just think it's a really helpful kind of cheat sheet on the pathways and different drugs and the reversal agents and how they work. So I think this is a really helpful kind of quick look at things. Uh, your platelets, platelet drugs, uh, you can start with your phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors. These are solostazole and dipyrimidol. Your P2Y12 inhibitors. This is cl cl clopidogrel, teclopidine, and ticagrelor. And then your COX are your NSAIDs, such as aspirin. Okay. And when it comes to secondary hemostasis, your farm here to know warfarin is a vitamin K epoxide redu reductase inhibitor. I actually have seen questions on USMLV that just in some, some form or another ask what enzyme warfarin uh, uh, disrupts to get what it's therapeutically aiming for. Your 10A inhibitors, these are apixaban, rivaroxaban, fondaparinu, Xarelto is uh, rivaroxaban, Eliquis is apixaban. Uh, if you don't know the little trick here, 10A, they have XA in it, rivaroxaban and apixaban have XA in it. Your direct thrombin, dipicotran, bivalarubin, and actually argatroban is another one. Um, that you can commit to memory if you have the brain space for it. And finally, your antithrombin accelerators, heparin, and your low molecular weight heparin, which is anoxaparin, brand name for that is Lovenox. So that is what you need to know for pharmacology. Thank you for listening to this. I hope it was helpful. Um, you know, I really enjoy hematology. I think it's I think it's an area that you can really score a lot of points out in US if you commit some of this to memory. Um, it's a really good way to get some points up on your score. Thank you for listening.